Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another wonderful episode of Oxygen Not Included in our Max Colonization series. You may remember, end of our last episode, that our colony looked a little bit like this. Well, I've been busy. As you can see, I've spent about 90 to 100 cycles cleaning everything up, really getting everything nice and tight before we begin our space program. We started off by digging everything out, and now they're starting the long process of doing the sweep. Now, this is all going to happen in the background, but we want to make sure we future-proof our series by keeping everything organized, keeping our pipe runs tight, and that way it saves us some frames per second down the road. We've also been busy on Frostine, although not quite as much. To start off with, we switched over into Squirrel Omelets. Reason being is that chill is still beaten down the door. You can see this area here is between 8 and 10 degrees, which means mealwood has a problem growing. And that's just the colony doing its thing because everything else is absolutely frigid. So we've built a little squirrel ranch here and put a space heater. Now the space heater is not doing anything exorbitant. It's only trying to keep it at 15 degrees, just warm enough for our arbor tree to continue growing to feed these pips, who then in turn feed our dupes by way of raw egg to omelets. Now that space heater is assisted by the fact that this liquid tepidizer is set at 13 degrees. And the reason why it's only running at 13 and not 15 is because we want that water to come in as cold as possible when it joins the very hot polluted water coming out of our lumber industry and petroleum generators. What ends up happening because this water is so cold, it mixes with a little bit of water from the petroleum generators. And right now you can see the tank is sitting around 18 degrees, not too shabby. We do have a problem with our oxygen. Well, not quite yet. All this oxygen is coming out at around 55 degrees. And eventually it would cause this area to get way too hot as well. So the sooner we can get some plastic, the sooner we can put some steam turbines here and start destroying some of this heat. I've also been busy down here a little bit. We've added four gas reservoirs, and that way we're able to grab as much of the natural gas coming out of this geyser as possible when it is active. Right now, the next activity period's about eight cycles away. Now we had to stop metal refinery because this pool of water is up at 70 degrees here and 75, 76 degrees here, which was causing some dupes to get the scalding. Not shabby, we got 11 tons of steel, 13 tons of cobalt, and two and a half tons of gold. We've also increased our lumber production. Long story short, with the extra polluted water coming out of our petroleum generators and our natural gas generators, I think we can sustain ourselves with a couple more trees. After all, remember Frostine's eventually going to get all of its oxygen from this salt water geyser, so 100% of this cool slush geyser can go towards lumber production. But there's another reason we've expanded lumber production, and that's because we want to increase polluted dirt production. Remember, more trees we feed to these ethanol distilleries, the more lumber we can get, but also the more polluted dirt we can get. Because each ethanol distillery produces a third of a kilo per second of polluted dirt. And that's where this beautiful invention comes into play. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dirtinator 5000. The name is subject to change. The Dirtinator is responsible for all the oxygen in our colony. All the polluted dirt comes in here by this conveyor rail and gets dropped off to where this auto sweeper can load up these sublimation stations as needed. When there's available oxygen pressure, the sublimation stations will produce more polluted oxygen, which then goes through this gauntlet of deodorizers, turning it into clean oxygen, where then these gas pumps feed it to our colony. And right now, it's the entire colony that those sublimation stations are feeding. We aren't blocked in by any sort of exosuits. The one concern I had about this is the deodorizers love their filtration medium in the form of sand normally. But they produce more clay than they use in sand. So what do we do? We turn all that clay into ceramic, and then we take the ceramic and turn it right back into sand. And this process actually nets us positive sand. Now the one issue is it does require more coal. 25 kilos per batch of ceramic, but that's the only other ingredient needed. Right now we're sitting at 62.3 tons of coal, and eventually we're gonna find some sage hatches to turn some of this excess dirt into coal. Because if you remember, they'll take 140 kilos worth of dirt and turn it into 140 kilos worth of coal. That's a great amount of conversion. The only issue with that is we'll need more pips. Right now each ranch has eight pips, that produces 160 kilos worth of dirt per cycle. Well, with our expanded tree production, we're using 
70 kilos worth of dirt in each ranch. So what I'm thinking is we add yet another pip ranch, which will give us more pip omelets, and that pip ranch will then be able to be responsible for just producing enough dirt to feed one sage hatch. In fact, seven pips and one sage hatch is a perfect conversion ratio of 140 kilos worth of dirt for 140 kilos worth of coal. I'd rather naturally plant the arbor trees for those pips, so where I can, I've saved the natural tiles. And I'm thinking this area might be perfect, because if those pips can plant the arbor trees themselves, we won't have to pay an additional polluted water cost. There were also some comments about the ethanol possibly boiling. Well, as you can see, it's been probably 120 cycles since our last episode, and the ethanol's gone up, I think, one degree? And part of the reason why is because all this lumber's coming in. In fact, there's almost 200 tons in this one production facility, and another 240 tons in this one. But all that lumber is coming in at 30, 35 degrees. And that's only because this ranch has managed to heat up. So what I'm thinking is we might be able to expand how far this rail goes and sort of filter it throughout this area to keep it as cool as possible. But I'm not even sure if that's necessary. I think the only reason it's increased by about a degree is because these ranches have increased by about 10 degrees. And all that happened just because I accidentally stopped the polluted water coming in over on, from Frostine, so it was getting nothing but all this hot water. But once again, that leads us back to the fact that we need plastic so we can start doing some significant temperature control in this colony. And that's exactly what we're doing in today's episode. We're going to space, and come hell or high water, we're finding plastic. Now, if you've watched my series in the past, you know I like to build sort of rocket platforms and a spaceport to house our space program. And we're gonna do it by starting right after this environmental area, and we're gonna use an absolute buttload of igneous rock insulated tiles. And from there, we're just gonna go over. Now here is our ice storage, so I'm going to have to put it on sweep only because the way this works is the duplicates would come up here, but they wouldn't be able to get through the door. So they'd be able to deliver the ice, but they wouldn't be able to grab it. While the duplicates are working on this, I think it's probably time to put in some suits. Not to mention, we probably would be benefited by using a telescope for a little while. So we've got some stuff to do. While the dupes are working on that, I want to decide where I'm going to put these suits. Right here is our longest rung that goes up and down the colony. So it sort of makes sense that this is the entrance into the spaceport. But I normally like to auctionate my entrance for obvious reasons. And I guess we still could, we just have to use a whole lot of drywall. So this is the start of it. This is going to be sort of our headquarters of our spaceport. I went looking for some drywall though and discovered we haven't researched it yet. But it did remind me to show you the fact that the Dirt Nader 5000 is using conveyor receptacles. I'm using conveyor receptacles, that way all the sand that's being produced by here can be production controlled just by the use of these receptacles. They'll only draw more sand off the rails when these receptacles need sand. Then these auto sweepers are in range of each receptacle, and not only do they take the sand from the receptacle and put it in the deodorizer, they also throw the clay right back into the conveyor loaders and send it all the way down here. There's a little bit of automation in play, but the long story short is this rock crusher doesn't take ceramic and create sand until this smart storage bin says it needs some. And then this smart storage bin that holds ceramic tells this kiln when to enable to disable to call for the creation of more ceramic, which is then handled all by auto sweeper that in turn grabs the clay and the charcoal and then puts it in the kiln to create the ceramic. But it reminded me that I wanted to talk to you about it because conveyor receptacles were locked under applied science research. Let's go have a check on Miko over on Frostine. Frostine now has our first material study terminal and it's a very simplistic process. We're grabbing radiation right off of this crashed satellite which then goes in this rad bolt generator fires it crossways to this rad bolt reflector and then delivers it to this material study terminal. Now we have it only on 51 and it ends up being about 50 when it hits the material study terminal. That way it delivers it either when Miko's not here or when they're standing right here and not in between which risks them getting hit. And as soon as this thing is full it sends an automation signal back up to the rad bolt generator that turns it off and says stop collecting rad bolts. And it's pretty important too because we don't want to spend the 480 watts required all of the time. So we only activate the material study terminal whenever we need a little bit of research done. 
such as in the case of the conveyor receptacle. Now we are in the market for another duplicate. You can see that we're up over 125,000 calories, which means we need to eat more. Unfortunately, this printing pod was not it. I am in the market for a doctor decorator, but so far there hasn't been a lot of luck. You may be wondering how many dupes we can support with the amount of polluted dirt we've got coming in. Well, remember, if each ethanol level produces one kilo per second, although let's be honest it's not producing one kilo per second because we're not using that much power we could technically run two of these sublimation stations max out which combined would give us 13 duplicates we're not quite there yet but for those of you curious we're actually going up in polluted dirt at seven duplicates on this colony i'll be able to tell because the overall polluted dirt will start going down when we're using more of it you might be wondering about this conveyor loader here it's only necessary to allow manual use to bring more polluted dirt in as it's produced here at the sludge press. Once all this is picked up, I think we can get rid of the sludge press because we've gotten just about all the polluted mud on this colony, but not the polluted dirt. So we'll have to make sure that we get rid of all of that polluted dirt and polluted mud before we can get rid of that conveyor loader. I really don't like the fact that drywall costs four times as much as a standard tile. I understand it's there probably for balance reasons, but drywall is thin and flimsy. A tile, you would think, is much more robust, but sadly, drywall costs twice as much. We're going to use granite for the extra decor. And there we have it our completed space headquarters. Now I know it's somewhat of humble beginnings. We have oxygen being piped up here from the bottom of the colony. Incidentally, it's also gonna be responsible for filling the Atmos suits. So I think we're probably gonna disconnect it from this side and have this run do the entire living area of our colony. I think this will work for now. This ridiculously duct tape solution is not gonna be permanent though, because remember, we're not gonna be down here for very much longer. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do with these natural gas generators and our other power production, but the only reason we were down here was because of this metal refinery, and right now we just don't have the available heat threshold for this water to be used as coolant. I've decided that I am going to break into the petroleum generator and lumber industry room, and we're going to use this simple little liquid lock. Now, there's hundreds of kilos worth of carbon dioxide in that room. I'm sure nothing's going to go wrong. Okay, something minor might have happened. I'm not saying one way or the other. Don't worry about it. It's only 10 kilos worth of carbon dioxide. It's it's good, right? It's, it's good. Long story short, though, I got in there to move around our lumber rails to be able to keep all this cool. I started noticing the temperature in the ethanol distilleries getting higher. It wasn't actually the pipes, it was the buildings themselves. So now all the lumber comes in, it absorbs about three to four degrees, which may be the magic number to keep everything in here chill. Just in case though, I built an overflow that would keep the ethanol moving. And if we need to, we can tie this into a bunch of tanks or into some additional petroleum generators. But now I'm debating on whether or not I should break back in there just to get rid of this little bit of polluted water. What happened here is I was using this bottle emptier to put some polluted water in. One dupe decided to exhale on the polluted water pile and blammo, we have a small issue. It's minor. In other news though, I think we found a great decorating duplicate and their spare time they can do some pick them up and set them down. Welcome to the colony, duplicate number 10. Eric W. Sorry about the not great conditions you've been welcomed into. Needless to say, we have all the gas pumps on the colony working overtime to make sure all that carbon dioxide, you know, doesn't kill us. Right now, it's okay. You know, they're eating in carbon dioxide, sleeping in carbon dioxide. I think we'll add a couple of more gas pumps over here, too, just to make sure that we're doing everything we can to get rid of it all. And look at this. Our doctor came right after the decorator. They're germ resistant and innately stylish. They're definitely not a veterinarian. Welcome to dupe number 11, Liana. I mean, at the minimum, now our refrigerator's in a sterile atmosphere. See that? Next level gaming. Now, for science, of course, I'm going to go to dinner and see how this colony survives. For the record, it's cycle 419. Well, wish the duplicates luck. And look at that, I come back a few short cycles later and things are looking better.
Not too bad. Now for the business at hand, we need to activate this telescope. Now the telescope provides 100% sunburn protection, but only 50% radiation protection. Which I don't think it's going to be too bad, because that would only be about 62.5 rads per cycle. So I'm not too worried about it. Obviously, duplicate health is not on the forefront of my mind. When life gives you carbon dioxide, it's time for a kitchen renovation. We now have our refrigerator sitting in some nice carbon dioxide, so hopefully to help keep all that food even more sterile than it was before being in the refrigerator. We also added an auto sweeper and moved some things around so the auto sweeper can grab all the completed foods and the ingredients and send them back and forth. Additionally, our scientist team has been hard at work in our fully functioning telescope. And the benefit of having three great scientists on this planetoid, not a single one of them is getting too much radiation before they switch out for the other. Well, as luck would have it, we've discovered two planetoids fairly close, with a possibility of a third. We'll see here shortly. First up, Aquazon. It has crash satellites and three different sources of water between its vents and geysers. The ocean biome, I think, is our best chance for a Dreco there, but I'm not 100% convinced, but it's okay. On the next planetoid over, Neutralina. Neutralina? We're gonna go with Neutralina. It has magma channels, a host of different vents and geysers, but more importantly, a jungle biome. And I'm very confident we'll find some Drekos there. Which means it's time to start building our rocket platforms. Now we're going to start with steel, even though I don't think the carbon dioxide would get hot enough to melt some other rocket platforms. But we have 11, 12 tons of it, so we might as well. And just now, our team of scientists have discovered Ariel. Ariel has small boulders, another frozen friend, don't worry buddy, we're coming, and some relatively uninteresting vents and geysers. Also on this planetoid is another magma biome, sandstone, wasteland, and tundra. Now for the rockets, we're going to use a couple of carbon dioxide engines. Well, for obvious reasons. And we're going to have a couple of gas reservoirs here to supply sort of a buffer for all the carbon dioxide these engines will use. Which means it's time to bring even more carbon dioxide out of this room. But don't worry, there's still 200 kilos per tile. And now all we have to do to get that carbon dioxide flowing is trigger our Atmo sensor. So I guess we'll say above 20,000 kilos, you can go green. And there it all goes. We had a little bit of research to do, and here's an example of Miko being able to conduct it at the material study terminal. And this crushed satellite, which I just realized I've been saying crashed satellite. But I guess both adjectives are true about said satellite. I mean, it's not bad. It's 129 rad bolts per cycle. In future colonies, you could line these things up and get a ton of radiation. All for free 99. Well, that and an exorbitant amount of power. During all this, I have completely forgotten that we didn't put in any, that we didn't put in any Atmo suits. We'll start with eight and we'll put the checkpoint in and that way no one else does anything else outside without at least having a suit on. We're also going to need an exosuit forge to make those suits. This spot looks as good as any. As for reed fiber, we have 141 units. And that's all thanks to just our bathroom system that's been feeding a pair of thimble reeds since the game started. And now for the reveal of our rockets. Yes, I know, they look ridiculous. First up is the SS Virgo 2. It has an orbital cargo module full of 1.6 tons of steel. That way we can build rocket platforms and things of that nature when we get there. We have a trailblazer module to launch. The duplicants are traveling in this nose cone down to the planetoid to build one platform for the other rocket. And inside, it's sparse. There's a little bit of oxalate for the mission from just the puffs that have dropped it. We had a total of about four tons, so we split them between the rockets. We have a little bit of Swamp Charred Heart, and it's just enough to get this duplicant there with one cycle or two of contingency rations. A bathroom with no sink and a cot. There's not even a morale bonus in here. Well, I suppose we can put a nice hanging pot right there. Isn't that nice? Next is Rover 41. Rover 41 has a basic nose cone, a solar planet module, and then the spacefarer module. This is going to be the living quarters for while the two duplicants are on the planetoid. Inside, it's not much better than the sparse livings in the tiny nose cone. I was able to get a barracks out of this, but that's about it. The introduction of this gas pump really messes everything up, and it needs to be at the very, very top. That way, there's no chance that it's going to take in any carbon dioxide when it's filling these two Atmosuit docks. 
We have one extra storage bin to hold some materials and also to issue the command to go grab a critter egg. And then we have a manual generator to be able to back up that crappy little solar panel. We would have added another solar panel, but we don't have the glass. We just happen to have at least 200 kilos from around the colony, but otherwise we could have fit one more. We also have a couple of ladder beds, a power outlet to bring the solar panel's power into this small battery, a couple of mess tables, and a couple of plants. Like I said, this is going to be a very, very short trip. We're getting there, we're grabbing some Draco eggs, and then we're leaving. Now for the duplicates are going, first, it's got to be John Mann. John Mann is really good at digging and pretty good at constructing. So we're going to skill scrub them because we definitely don't want the 15 morale requirement on those rockets. And then we're going to take one of the scientists. Only because the scientists have had such a large science lead that they have decent skills all around. So if we need to put them into one thing or another, we'll be able to. So let's get the two John skill scrubbed. Thank you little dense puffs for the donation of your oxalite. I mean, we have them all over this colony and we're never gonna kill them because at a minimum they're providing either slime or oxygen and that's beautiful. John Mann is fresh out of the skill scrubber so automatically we know they need at least one point into rocket piloting. And then I'm gonna go ahead and give them both, one in construction and one in digging. We're gonna need to be able to dig there and the extra point in construction will help build those rocket platforms faster. Same thing for the other John, and I believe we're ready. Now this is going to be a little scary because you know nothing survives the plan. Last thing we'll do is add an Atmosu checkpoint right here. We added a little bit of dirt to be able to run this outhouse, and we have a little bit of cobalt to be able to fix the Atmosu stations when they invariably take in some of the polluted oxygen that's going to off-gas from the polluted dirt outside of this outhouse. We could put in a couple of filter systems to make sure none of the polluted oxygen makes it in there, but this module is only going to be used for a little bit, probably just this first trip. Now let's grab John Mann for one rocket, and John Archer for the second. Now these rocket engines are not very good. They have a maximum of a six tile range and only move at a speed of 1.6 tiles. Well, Rover 41 moves at 1.9 tiles per second, probably because this has one more modules worth of height as this is a height of nine and this one's a height of 10. Either way, we're off to orbit Neutralino. There's one, the second one is set. And now we'll try a dual launch because you know that would just look cool. And away we go. Fingers crossed we didn't forget anything. Now in the rocket, we definitely want to take John Archer out of his suit. That way they can breathe the oxygen in here and leave as much in that suit as possible. Now what would have been really smart is for me to send a rover over here first. And that way we could actually get a view of the planetoid. As it is, we're going to be playing best guess when we land that orbiter. So far, the Johns are doing well though. Oh, I knew I forgot something. I didn't put a plant in this hanging pot. Maybe we'll bring back a new species from the other planetoid. I also forgot while we're here, we actually have to deconstruct this refrigerator to build the ladder tiles to get up to the cot. We're using Swamp Charred Heart for the specific reason that it doesn't go off. Now there's only about four or five cycles worth, but I'm expecting that it shouldn't take us more than a cycle to get that egg and then head back home. Fingers crossed. And look at this, we have less than 60 seconds before we make it to orbit. It is a relatively short flight. And I'll bet the duplicates are happy considering they're living like this. Now we were able to put in a couple of extra bricks to protect them from radiation, but they're still going to be getting some, especially over on Rover 41. And now that we're orbiting this planetoid, we can throw down the orbital cargo module. So we'll just click deploy and all that stuff's going to go down there. I really, really hope I don't have to unpack this. This may have been a very bad calculation. And now we'll throw John Archer inside of their suit just long enough to be able to go back to the star map, select them for the trailblazer module, and then click deploy. And it does look like we have a bunch of steel stuck in these little modules. I think I can unpack them manually, but I don't know. Godspeed, John. Welcome, buddy. Now instantly we're gonna pause. I think I can click empty storage. And there they go. Well, that's gonna work out well. Now we just need to empty all of these, all in enough time, to build a platform here before John suffocates. And it looks like we're going to be fine. John's Atmos suit still has over 60 kilos worth of oxygen. Now they're probably going to make a mess somewhere, but hey, more importantly, look at our friends. Now because the planetoid just spawned, they probably won't lay eggs for a little while, but we will see. 
If not, we'll make one of them a rancher and put a drop-off zone on the rocket itself. Well, that's not fair. Apparently, clay can build comfy beds out of obsidian, but we can't. All right, now we have our 800 kilos worth of steel. We'll build that first, and then we're going to keep digging out some of these things here because we're going to need ladder to be able to get into the spacefare module. No, buddy, it's not time to go to sleep. Sorry, uh, red alert. I mean, I hate to do it to you, buddy, but it's either that or you just flat out die. With that built, before that rocket even comes down, we're going to build some ladders, and then we're going to land Rover 41. Now, this might sting a bit, but... John's in a super suit. Oh yeah, that looks a little warm, huh? <laughs> and on this rocket, we could actually change the cruise towards both Johns, so John will be able to get into this one and have a fresh Atmo suit dock ready to go. As for the Virgo 2, well, we can send it home on autopilot. All right, the two Johns are safely on the planetoid with fresh Atmo suits. I mean, things are actually looking good. We have about two cycles worth of food, so let's get to work. I suppose we can get rid of this lander. And since I don't see any eggs, I think we're just gonna make one of them a rancher. And inside here, we're just gonna put a critter drop off. Nice and easy. Drekos, are you ready to find out where your new home is? This is beautiful. I mean, this could have worked out much, much worse. Well, other than John getting trapped right here. Uh, nope. Buddy, you need to get down, like, right now. Now stay down here, please, thank you. I mean, look at the lengths that we go to just to get Drekos. Now, the argument could be made that we could have just kept going to another planetoid to get the oil, but that would have been a limited amount of plastic. This will be much more. Now, unfortunately, this Dreco is 47, and this one is 60, so we'll have a limited time frame. We have to get them groomed and reproducing in short order. All right, now let's make one of the Johns a Critter Rancher. In fact, we'll just go ahead and make both the Johns Critter Ranchers. Inside of our rocket, we'll select Drekos and Dreklets, just in case. And then it's just a matter of scooping them up whenever we can. Since we still have a couple of cycles worth of food, it's probably worth it just to go exploring a little bit. And if you were wondering how safe that orbital cargo module is, well, you can see that it's scattered it all across the planetoid, so that was definitely taking a couple chances. But that's why it was good that we had 1.6 tons and we only had to build one rocket platform. Oh my goodness. Look at what's down here. I would love to bring this Slickster home. Unfortunately, we don't have any plastic to make traps out of. I wouldn't suppose one of you would mind laying an egg if they could lay an egg and we can get that egg home. We could take all this carbon dioxide, start feeding the Slicksters, and create oil and petroleum. It's okay. I know where you live now. I'll be back. Oh yeah, we found a few more Drekos. Come to Papa. All right, the last thing we're gonna do on this planetoid is seal it back up here. I don't want all this gas to escape, and that way all these pinch of pepper nuts and everything keep growing, and it allows the Dreko to keep eating the balm lilies, but we'll be back soon for some Slickster eggs. With everybody loaded up, it's time to change our destination back to here. And we're ready to go. Now, there is a fuel warning. <laughs> and the reason why there's a fuel warning, because we only have enough carbon dioxide for a one-way trip. Luckily, it's only supposed to be a one-way trip. We'll acknowledge the warnings and begin the launch sequence. I mean, that was a pretty successful trip, if you ask me. We're coming home with four Drekos. We have 1,700 calories. They'll be able to split it. They'll be fine. And the autopilot Virgo the second made it home, Elon Musk style. We do already have it on grounded, so nobody's going to come in here and use the toilet. Not that they'd actually want to. But we are going to uncheck Oxalite from here because we have better things to use our Oxalite for. And if we ever need to use this rocket again, at least it'll have a Mirthleaf plant. The Rover 41 made it home A-OK. -okay. Now this rocket interior will definitely need some updating before we take it on a larger trip. But we'll keep loading all the oxalate into here, and that way we'll have one rocket ready just in case. Now all that's left to do is transplant those Drekos and get our Dreco farm started. And when you look at that, our colony's back to normal. I mean, you can almost not even tell that there was a potentially colony-ending carbon dioxide bomb that went off. By the way, the new real system is working like a dream. The ethanol inside of the petroleum generators stays at around 73 degrees, just like the ethanol in the tanks. So if you are going to use a system like this, make sure you send that lumber all the way through it or use some other cooling potential to make sure that 
ethanol doesn't boil. Not a problem so much in the reservoirs, but with the small amount inside the distillers, when it got backed up in the pipes, there was definitely a potential for problems. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and not just the giant carbon dioxide cloud. There'll be plenty more hilarious adventures just like that one. I look forward to hearing everything you have to say in the comments below, and I'll talk to you soon.